need to. Okay. Good afternoon. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter, and I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, July 11th, 2023. This evening's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV. Comcast 73, Verizon Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. May I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the Open Meetings Act as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland General Provisions Article 3-305, B1, B7, and B8 to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. Do I have a motion? So moved, Young. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. yes. Ms. Dolosky? Yes. 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 Ms. Han? Ms. Han? Ms. Harvey? Ms. Harvey? Ms. Drummond? Drummond. Ms. Pumphrey? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. 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 Dr. Dr. Savoy? Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Motion carries.
Whoops. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter, and I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, July 11th, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by me. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the July 11th agenda. Dr. Yarbrough, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am not aware of any additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Okay. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter. Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Yarbrough, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, ethics review panel appointment. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D5? So move, Young. Thank you. Do Second I have a Stileski. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempaw? Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Yarbrough. Madam Chair Lichter, members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments. We are chief of schools, director, office of staffing, principal, Clark Gibbons Middle School, principal, Kenwood High School, principal, Norwood Elementary School, principal, Pikesville Middle School, principal, Towson High School, Assistant Principal, Battle Grove Elementary School, Assistant Principal, Chesapeake High School, Assistant Principal, Chesapeake Terrace Elementary School, mm -hmm. Assistant Principal, Halstead Academy, Assistant Principal, McCormick Elementary School, and Assistant mm -hmm. Principal, Middle River Middle School. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Hen. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Dr. Yarbrough. 
Thank you. This evening, we're pleased to begin with recognizing in person the following appointments that were, were approved at the last board meeting. Mr. William Brown, he's attending with his wife, Kristen Brown. Please stand. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brown was promoted from assistant principal, Middle River Middle School, to principal, Middle River Middle School. His background includes assistant principal at Middle River Middle, uh, sorry, Middle River Middle and Herf Hereford High. He also was a social studies teacher and part of the Aspiring Leaders Program, bringing 18 years of experience to Baltimore County. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Charlene Domino. She is attending with Dr. Kimberly Colson, Culbertson, Assistant Principal of Towson High, and newly appointed tonight Principal of Towson High School. <laughs> Ms. Domino is moving from the position of Principal of Towson High School to Director of Teacher Development and Department of Organizational Development and Leadership. Her background includes Principal of Towson High, Principal of Park, Parkville High, Assistant Principal of Eastern Tech High, Spanish teacher, English teacher, middle school teacher at Parkville Middle, and classroom teacher at Logan Elementary. Congratulations, Ms. Domino. <laughs> Next appointment is Ms. Feeney. She is attending with her significant other, Daniel Kelly. Please stand. She has moved from the position of Principal Arbutus Middle School to Executive Director, Human Resources Recruitment and Staffing. Her previous roles include Assistant Principal at Catonsville Middle, Elementary Teacher at Westchester, West Town, and Catonsville Elementary Schools, English Teacher at Old Court Middle. She brings 34 years of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Ms. Feeney. Our next appointment, Ms. Jennifer Ganaris. She is attending with her husband, Jarrett Ganaris. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Ms. Ganaris has moved from the position of principal, Sparrows Point Middle School, to administrator of school improvement in the Department of Schools. Her previous experience includes principal of Battle Grove Elementary, assistant principal of Pine Grove Elementary, Office of English Language Arts on the Academic Intervention Team and Classroom Teacher at Kingsville Elementary and Winfield Elementary. She brings 29 years of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations. <laughs> Next appointment is Dr. Jess Grimm. He is attending this evening. Please, you are standing <laughs> to be recognized. He is moving from the position of Acting Director of Transportation to Chief Operating Officer for Baltimore County Public Schools. His previous experience includes Manager of Business Operations, Principal of Chesapeake High, Assistant Principal, Overly High School and Dundalk High School, Social Studies Teacher, Parkville High School, and Sudbury Magnet Middle. He has 26.7 years of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Dr. Grimm. Next appointment is Mr. Bradley Kahujan. He is attending with his wife, Kimberly Kahujan. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Moving from the position of manager of staffing to director of transportation. His background includes manager of staffing, human resources officer in staffing, human resource analyst in staffing, and previous employment outside of Baltimore County Public Schools. He's been with BCPS for 5.6 years. Congratulations. Our next appointment 
is Catherine Matulonis. She is attending with her former principal, Lauren Tillman, at Scotts Branch Elementary School. Please stand and be recognized. She's moving from the position of teacher of staff development in Scotts Branch Elementary School to assistant principal, Relay Elementary School. Her background includes staff development teacher, stat teacher at Scotts Branch, resource teacher at Scotts Branch and Randallstown Elementary, mentor teacher at Randallstown, and teacher of technology integration at Newtown Elementary. She has 21 years experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations. <laughs> Next appointment is Dr. Kalisha Miller. She is attending with her husband, George Miller. Please stand to be recognized. Dr. Miller is moving from the position of principal, Pikesville High School, to administrator of school improvement with the Department of Schools. Her previous experience includes assistant principal at Dundalk High School, director of the Office of Special Education, special education teacher at Deer Park Middle Magnet and Sudbrook, Sudbrook Middle Magnet. Also prior experience at Maryland State Department of Education and Baltimore City Public Schools. She has 19 and a half years experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Dr. Miller. <laughs> Next appointment, Amy Pritchett, who is attending this evening. Moving from the position of Assistant Supervisor of World Languages in Carroll County Public Schools, so welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools, to Coordinator of World Languages in the Office of World Languages and BCPS. Her background includes position of Teacher of Middle School Spanish and ELA in Carroll County, Teacher of ESOL, as well as Career Connections Coordinator and Spanish Teacher in Carroll County Public Schools. Welcome to Baltimore County. Next appointment is Mr. Craig Reed, who is attending this evening. He is moving from the position of principal, Perry Hall High School, to executive director of high schools and the Department of Schools. His previous experience includes principal of Patapsco High School, assistant principal of Patapsco High School, and previous experience outside of Baltimore County, including Baltimore City Public Schools and Woodbury Public Schools. He has 14 years of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Mr. Reed. <laughs> Not attending this evening, is Ms. Shanika Georgie. She is moving from the position of classroom teacher, Newtown Elementary School, to assistant principal in Newtown Elementary School. Congratulations to Ms. Georgie. <laughs> and for the appointments this evening, Carl Armstrong, please stand to be recognized. <laughs> Mr. Armstrong is attending with his husband, Justin Graves. He is moving from the position of assistant principal Parkville High School to principal Kenwood High School. His previous experience includes teacher of Spanish at Perry Hall High School, teacher at Deer Park Mat Middle Magnet, and he has 16 years of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment this evening is for the Assistant Principal of the Year in Baltimore County, Nicole Bridges. She is attending with her fiance, Ronnie McCain, the daughter. Assistant Principal Towson High School, she is moving to the principal of Pikesville Middle School. Her previous experience includes stat teacher at Randallstown High School, 
math teacher at Windsor Mill Middle, and previous experience in Harford County Public Schools. She has 17 years of experience with Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations. <laughs> Next appointment is Amanda Bull, who is attending with her husband, Matthew Bull. Please stand. She is moving from the position of guidance teacher at Oakley Elementary School to assistant principal Halstead Academy. Her background includes school counselor at Oakley Elementary School, Baltimore Highlands, and she brings eight years of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations. <laughs> and for the last third of Towson High School, <laughs> it's a nice appointment is Dr. Kimberly Culbertson, previous Maryland State Assistant Principal of the Year. She is, <laughs> she is attending with Charlene Domino, the newly appointed Director of Teacher Development, <laughs> because this evening, Dr. Culbertson is being appointed Principal of Towson High School. Her previous experience includes stat teacher at Delaney High School, science teacher at Delaney High School, and Chesapeake High School. She has 17 years of experience with Baltimore County. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment of the evening is Dr. Raquel Jones, Chief of Schools. Please stand to be recognized. Dr. Jones is moving from consulting administrator to chief of schools. Her previous experience includes community superintendent, Baltimore County, executive director of school support, secondary, school district of Philadelphia, Baltimore City Public Schools, Richmond City Public Schools, and New York Department of Education. Dr. Jones has seven years of experience with Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations, Dr. Jones. Her next appointment is Amanda Leslie. She is attending with her husband, Robert Leslie. Please stand. <laughs> Ms. Leslie is moving from the position of IEP facilitator in the Department of Special Education to assistant principal, Chesapeake Terrace Elementary School. Her previous experience also included teacher of special education, self-contained at Dundalk High School, teacher of self special education inclusion at Padonia International Elementary and Shady Spring Elementary, resource teacher and classroom teacher at Shady Spring. She has 15 years experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Caitlin Rowe. She is attending with her husband, J.D. Rowe. Please stand. She is moving from the position of teacher social studies, Middle River Middle School, to assistant principal, Middle River Middle School. Her previous ba background includes teacher of social studies and teacher of reading. She has 11.2 years experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Susan Stansberry. She is attending with her son, Cole, and daughter, Jessica. Please stand. <laughs> she is moving from the position of human resources officer in the Office of Staffing to director, Office of Staffing. Her previous experience include personnel analyst and previous experience outside of Baltimore County, including Baltimore City Public Schools, and different uh, department stores, and she has 13 years of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations. <laughs> Next appointment is Mark Taylor. He's attending with his wife, Angela. Please stand. <laughs> he 
He is moving from the position of assistant principal, Vincent Farm Elementary School, to principal, Norwood Elementary School. His previous experience includes assistant principal at Newtown Elementary School, classroom teacher at Woodhome Elementary and Bedford Elementary. He has 19 and a half years experience with Baltimore County. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Perry Warren. He is attending this evening. <laughs> he is moving from the position of assistant principal, General John Stricker Middle School, to principal, Arbutus Middle School. His previous experience includes assistant principal at Arbutus Middle School, science teacher at Pine Grove Middle and Deep Creek Middle. He has 15 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations. <laughs> Not attending this evening, but watching virtually, Logan Belinda moving from the position of assistant principal, Gettysburg Area Middle School, to assistant principal, Chesapeake High School. We welcome you to Baltimore County Public Schools. His previous experience also included a teacher in Baltimore County, social studies at Cockeysville Middle and Perry Hall High School. He has eight years of previous experience in Baltimore County. So welcome back, Mr. Belinda. <laughs> also watching from home is Stacy Georgiou. She's moving from the position of IEP facilitator to assistant principal of Battle Grove Elementary School. Previous experience includes special education inclusion teacher at Chase Elementary, Colgate Elementary, teacher of reading at Grange Elementary and Dogwood Elementary, and previous experience outside of Baltimore County Public Schools. She has 23 years of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Ms. Giorgio. <laughs> Final appointment for the evening is Melvin Holmes Jr., who is watching virtually, moving from the position of assistant principal, Pimlico Elementary School in Baltimore City Public Schools, to assistant principals, McCormick Elementary School. His previous experience includes teacher of mathematics in Drew Elementary School, special education chairperson, assistant principal in the District of Columbia, principal, in Baltimore City Public Schools, special education coordinator and teacher of special education. Welcome to Baltimore County, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> and if I may, uh, please, uh, I would like to thank Human Resources, who has been moving nonstop, as well as all of the different departments that have been working day and night to make sure that we move these appointments forward so we are ready in time for school for our students. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough, and huge congratulations to everyone. So many of you, I have watched your journeys, and I'm very excited to see where you will go next. So um, it was, that was great. Took a long time, but it was great. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens as appropriate. We will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. Online registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting. and was closed at 3 p.m yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. No speaker substitutions will be allowed. For those who are not selected through the online registration, a wait list sign a wait list sign-up sheet was available 30 minutes prior to the meeting. If a registered speaker is absent, speaker slots will be reassigned from the wait list so that the 10 speaker slots are allocated. In accordance with recommendations from the Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and the Office of School Safety, we've implemented the following safety and security protocols to enhance the safety of all our attendees. 
Participants should be seated in the room during meetings. Individuals who need to stand up should go out in the hallway to do so. Participants should not approach the table unless called upon to speak and should not approach the dais. While we appreciate the creativity many have shown during their presentations, materials brought to the table are limited to electronic devices, presentation papers, and posters no larger than 11 by 14 inches. Other items should be left in your seats. Information to be given to the board is to be handed to the staff member who is seated in the front area of the meeting space. Information for other participants is to be left on the designated table outside in the hall. In the event of an emergency that requires an emergency response, such as a lockdown, lockout, or evacuation, staff from the Office of School Safety will direct participants. If evacuating, participants will exit through the rear or front door in an orderly manner, leave the building, and cross over to the parking lot or other safety distance as warranted. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific students or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personnel remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute time clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. Okay. I will now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Mr. Billy Burke from CASE. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Mrs. Lichter, Vice Chair Mrs. Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Yarborough, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of CASE. Welcome back to Ms. Stolusky, our newest board member. Thank you for your dedication and commitment to the students of BCPS. There are two significant issues that CASE members face this summer. The first is special education support at the elementary level. Last year, BCPS planned to provide IEP facilitators to elementary schools. The plan had to be changed because of the staffing shortage. The facilitator positions had to be returned to the classroom. That was absolutely the right solution for the immediate problem of staffing. But the special education support problem remains. The workload for assistant principals is unmanageable. Assistant principals are responsible for informal and formal observations of staff, transportation, discipline, testing, staff development, and IEP facilitation. That's just the big rocks. There are dozens of problems to be solved each day. If your school only services inclusion and speech students, you dedicate one day a week to team meetings. If you have a regional program, add on an additional day of team meetings. If you have more than one regional program, add on an additional day of team. If your program supports students that struggle with appropriate behavior, add on a last minute meeting every time the behavior might lead to a disciplinary action. Some APs run team three days a week, but they still have to do all the other tasks. Assistant principals don't get the opportunity to become instructional leaders and prepare to become principals without extraordinary efforts. And they are dedicated so they get it done. They work from 6 a.m. to 11 at night. They work weekends. They miss plays and sporting events for their own kids. We must solve this problem. Although I spoke today about elementary assistant principals, secondary assistant principals face similar workload issues. I will speak to their plight at another meeting. The second issue is the staffing shortage. Once schools have completed hiring, specific sport supports must be available to schools that still have openings. Currently, staffing shortages are covered by teachers that are paid to teach during their planning times and support staff like resource teachers and paraeducators. This is absolutely the right thing to do in an emergency, but we can't continue in, to operate in emergency mode. It's not sustainable, and students and staff lose, with, lose out with this option. 
Program and course choice must be modified to match the available staff. Online, virtual, and self-paced options must be available and expanded for students to get the courses they need and want, but aren't available when there's not enough staff. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of CASE. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leah Duffy. Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton from Tabco. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Dr. Yarborough, and members of the board. It is so good to see a fully seated board. Welcome and congratulations, Ms. Stileski. I look forward to working with you and all the board members as we address the challenges and opportunities that face us. We must be sure that we focus on what is truly important for the success of our students and our school system. There are many distractions and it would be easy to let our attention go to these but we must remain focused on our vision, purpose, and core values because our students need us to do this. Dr. Yarbrough, congratulations on your first official board event meeting, and of course, I look forward to continuing to work with you and your team. I wanna thank you for the Meet the Superintendent events you have had and continue to have. Feedback I have heard has been positive. <clears throat> your honesty in acknowledging systemic shortcomings and your willingness to address them has given staff and community members a belief that your leadership will get BCPS on track to become the world-class school system we all want. While summer is supposed to be a time we can all take some time, I know that is not the case for many of us. Educators are working summer jobs, planning for next year, taking classes, completing their safe school trainings. Thank you for working with Tabco to ensure that that time is paid that will give our educators more time to plan and prepare for their students once the school year starts. Please know that as always, while the work is hard and we won't always agree, we stand at the ready to have the conversation and do the work that in ensures, as Dr. Yarbrough has stated, that our students come first in all we do. I look forward to the work and the outcomes we will attain together. Have a great summer, and I hope everybody finds some time to relax. Thank you. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Louise Baker. Good evening. Hello and thank you. My name is Louise Baker. I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree both in clinical social work. I was a licensed certified social worker. At age 19, I became a volunteer big sister and still remain close to this sister to date. I have four biological children, three grandbabies, and both a surrogate black and Asian son. My social work career began in protective services and quickly transitioned to foster care and later adoptions in Baltimore County. My point is I've spent my entire adult life caring for children. I am now questioning whether this board actually cares for children or is harming them. Allow me to elaborate. All the children I'm referencing here are real children that were students in one classroom last year. I am concerned that the severely autistic child in the classroom gets his hands on lawn boy and sexually abuses his little brother, thus creating both a sex abuse victim and a juvenile sex offender. I am concerned that the child with severe anger management issues because of abandonment by his mother reads assassination classroom and becomes the next mass school shooter. I am concerned that the selective mute in the classroom reads tricks, gets forced into prostitution, and has no outlet to speak or get help. I'm concerned that the child living in a hotel reads heroin, runs into a drug dealer, and becomes the next fentanyl-laced heroin overdose victim. And heaven forbid the white child placed in a black foster home reads push and decides to make a false sex abuse allegation against her foster father thinking this might speed up reunification with her biological mother. These are possible and perhaps probable case scenarios. What are you doing about these harmful books that have no value or place in our county schools? 
Did you know research shows that the human brain is not fully developed until age 25? Did you know people under 25 think with their amygdala, the emotional part of their brain, as opposed to the rational part? Why did it take Mary McComas 11 months to respond to a request to review genderqueer? What if one of these scenarios were to happen during that time? Trix comes with a warning not to read if you're under the age of 18, yet where's Waldo, as well as the Bible, are banned? This is insane. You were elected to help make Baltimore County Public Schools the best they could possibly be. This is clearly not happening. Perhaps it is time to have these dangerous and clearly inappropriate materials reviewed by an expert in child psychology or neurology instead of educators. These professionals may very possibly ask that these books be removed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ramona Basillo. Good evening. Good evening. Um, good evening, Chair, Woman Lecter, uh, the board, and our superintendent, Dr. Yarborough. It's my pleasure to be here today. I'm going to talk very, very briefly, and I hope the, the record captures everything that I'm here to discuss. Um, the hat I'm wearing today is community member and community activist in support of education. I'm on a community board with my homeowners association, the master association for over 30 developments in our subdivision. I also work as a coalition of former PTA presidents, alumni of Deer Park Middle Magnet School, and some businesses in the Northwest area, particularly Owings Mills. I'm here today for three reasons. First, I want to thank the previous board and returning members of this board for your expeditious work on the boundary study. Um, in 2021, many of you may remember, I was here before the board where our building was figuratively on fire with 1,640 students well beyond the state-rated capacity. You responded to that quickly, expeditiously, and I believe fairly. Thank you for taking care of the past. If the past is prologue to the future, I want to talk a little bit about our current situation. And not only at Deer Park Middle Magnet School, where we're grateful and we appreciate all the work, the partnerships that have happened throughout the central office with the superintendent, with the staff, with communities, and with consultants, but we were able to put in place a boundary study that dealt with the initial issues. What's remaining now in the present are some issues around infrastructure, not just Deer Park Middle Magnet, but our sister campus next door, Deer Park Elementary School, where there's leaking, flooding, poor HVAC, and the like. So we urge this board and the staff to take a look at Deer Park Elementary School and Deer Park Middle School so that we can be proactive. And third, I have a proposal. My proposal is with the existing space in Deer Park, with the elementary school, the new school plan, and the space that surrounds those schools. Why don't we think ahead, have an opportunity to pioneer in reverse, and think about a comprehensive plan where we can address the facility needs, the new building, the space that's required, and also the community needs for that space. Let's pioneer reverse, and instead of playing whack-a-mole with boundary studies in those two schools, let's see what we can do about a comprehensive plan to work at Deer Park Middle Magnet and the elementary school in the surrounding fields. I think I got it in. Thank you, everybody. You God did. bless you. <laughs> Hope you have a chance to get the break. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Jenkins. Turning this into a habit. Oh, okay. Hi, um, Good, Scott good Jenkins. Hi, uh, Chair Lichter, um, Superintendent Yarborough. To the new member, appreciate you being here. And I apologize, we're missing uh, Miss Drummond. I'm a Parkville alum, so I'm very excited for her to be on this board. I just wanted to touch base. I know last meeting there was, um, we all thought the boundary study was going to pass and there was been some concern. So I just wanted to come back tonight and make sure that we were all on the same wavelength as to what went on. I had sent out a four-page um, email to you all di diagramming what has gone on since February throughout the Boundary Study community. I hope um, you all had a chance to read it. 
I also want to talk about um, the numbers of these maps. Map A, which became Map E. Uh, I know there's been talk of some schools dominating the conversation and not other schools apart. When the numbers are weighted, and I had given this out a couple months ago, the numbers are weighted, Map A is 60% support and 23% against. Map B is 39% support, 37 against. Map C is 24% for, 53% against. And Map D, which was the other alternative that they considered, that the committee considered at the last meeting, was 24% and 54% and 52% against. It was overwhelming throughout the boundary study that this is what the public wanted. I think this is also shown in the fact that when we had the meetings on March 8th and March 9th, one at Parkville High School, one at Carver, that so many parents showed up. Um, I know some of the board members were there. I know committee members were there. Parents showed up, and they were from the whole area. And we talked, and we worked, and we all tried to figure out how to make Map A better, because that seemed to be the reason so many people were hearing Map A is that was the one that really was supported from the beginning. I spent six years on the planning board. I spent two, year, two CM, CZMP zoning cycles. I sat in public meetings till one and two in the morning so people could have their two to three minutes to talk about development in all seven council districts. And parents showed up to fight over development. It didn't matter where we were, what community we were in, how they had to get there, they showed up. Parents show up. And it would be insulting when 30,000 children are involved to think because parents didn't come, they couldn't get there, they didn't want to support it. There was not one person at the public meeting in opposition to this map. Not one. The four councilmen that represent this area, Democrat and Republican in 2023, that's a miracle that we can get them to agree, support this map. I know there was some concern about, um, there's an E1 presentation coming later. I think if you read the Greater Hillendale Community Association letter, how the walkability, the wraparound services have evolved, the things that make that a community school, those parents want Lock Raven Academy. So I just hope tonight that we can get this done. We want to work with you to make this school system as strong as it can. Please pa pass Matt B tonight and let's get moving on with our lives. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sherry Williams. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Um, thank you. Good evening, Dr. Yarborough and board members. My name is Cherie Williams. I am a uh, BCPS special educator entering my 20th year with Baltimore County Public Schools. I'm a parent of a BCP uh, class of 2017 graduate. I also am a long term, a uh, long time. Baltimore County resident in the Northwest area, I would say. Um, I've had the pleasure of speaking with the previous board regarding some concerns I have with the North, Northwest corridor of Baltimore County, um, specifically the impact changes and or lack of changes will have on Deer Park Middle Magnet School. Um, as I've discussed in the past with the board, the overcrowding that Deer Park has experienced. Just two years ago, we were at 1,600 students, a one-floor building. It led to uh, fights. It led to unsafe hallway transitions, uh, staff shortages, continued staff shortages, extremely high mental and physical stress levels for both uh, staff and students. Uh, we were given trailers, thank you. However, that left our building vulnerable, kids trying to get to class, um, propping the doors open on purpose. Um, at one point, we even uh, found a homeless person living in one of the trailers. Um, with that, uh, the housing construction in the area, if you look at the Lions Mills, Randallstown, and Owings Mills corridor, or just drive down Lions Mills, I'll just say. Right. Um, I will say the 22-23 school year was great at Deer Park, greatly improved, and I look forward to returning and being part of that progression. Uh, however, the restructuring of Deer Park Elementary. So me as a community member, um, I'd like to know where I and other community members can have input to what happens to the new Deer Park, the soon to be old uh, Deer Park Elementary building. Um, you know, where can we share our proposals or what we would like to see happen to that space, if possible? Um, how will the uh, PE area, which is are the fields in the back of Deer Park, 
uh, middle be impacted by the construction of Deer Park Elementary? Um, we have, uh, and how will Deer Park Elementary's uh, new structure impact the possible expansion of Deer Park Middle Magnet? So we have new families and new communities housing in the area. Those students are zoned for Deer Park Middle in the next five to 10 years, which to me leads to overcrowding. We have some wonderful new um, housing uh, developments, which speak to me as a community member. I see, I think of affluent young couples ready to start families. As a teacher, I think of my school is going to be overcrowded again in the next five or 10 years. So I'm asking, you know, what about Deer Park? And I look for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alexa, and I apologize if I mess up your name, Scioto. Yoto. Okay. Um, next speaker is Mr. Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Superintendent Yarbrough, and members of the board. Thank you for your time. I'm Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking as an individual. Not to give a what I did on summer vacation story, but I spent this past week in Orlando at the National Education Association Representative Assembly. Along with 6,000 of my peers, I spent several 11-hour days split between galvanizing presentations and marathon parliamentary sessions that pushed Roberts to its very limits. As a special educator, I was particularly impacted by the main stage talk from Helena Donato Sapp, a 14-year-old who commanded the entire assembly, and by a Zoom call with Dan Habib, whose films I hope to use for professional development and to remind us of the nature of our charge. However, the most important presentation of the week was about community schools. Mirroring the concept of community schools itself, the panel members sat equal with each other, Yes, school system leaders, but also students, parents, support professionals, and certified educators, all with equal footing and equal voice. Most of the stories about community schools that I have heard so far have revolved around identifying a significant issue that was affecting student achievement at a particular school, working with groups in local government to identify a solution to that issue, and then implementing that solution to positive effect. And that story is both great and important, but it's easy to focus on individual schools' stories and to miss the point of the program, giving voice and empowerment to students and families. The question is, how do we get information from families who don't fill out surveys? Having the meet the superintendent evenings at geographic regions throughout the county, like having the county council budget hearings throughout the county, is certainly a great first step. I recall a parent at a county council budget hearing advocating for BCPS to have more and more accessible after school activities and a way for their child to go home after those activities. I hope that their family is able to identify a club or sport that their high schooler can engage in and I hope that that helps and I hope that that helps their family truly feel like part of the school. Did we as a system hear that parent? I have heard parents ask to be communicated with in the language that they speak at home. Conversely, I've heard teachers be surprised to call home and not have known ahead of time that the parent didn't have English as their primary language. We need to know the needs and preferences of student families in order for us to all feel like part of the same team. What will it look like when every school, even those that don't meet the blueprint criteria, has embraced the core concepts of community schools, meeting the needs of the families? We need to achieve this vision in order to safeguard the concept of public schools as an instrument for, of, and by the communities that we serve. If community schools is a new concept for you, please read up on them and watch videos about them. They are our way forward. Happy summer. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. There were no um, speakers signed up on our wait list at this time. So the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And for that, I call on Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you, Chair Lichter. So this evening, I am excited to share my first superintendent's report with members of Team BCPS. Um, I'll begin by walking you through just a few updates on the transition team and provide an update on our community feedback that we've received to date, as well as ways that we can continue to stay connected as we move forward. 
I am truly grateful that 39 people are willing to, next slide please, 39 people are willing to lend their expertise to inform our next level of work as members of Team BCPS. We're thrilled that our award-winning teacher, administrator, central office, support services, and transportation leaders of the year are a part of our team. Co-chaired by Ms. Snell and Dr. Anthony, the team includes all unions, current and retired principals, retired large district and state of Maryland, former superintendents, associate superintendents, deputy superintendents, the pr president of CCBC, membership from the Wallace Foundation, and county government. Together, these 39 people are working to make sure that when within a defined scope of work over 21 days that they are working across five committees to make sure that they are reviewing major components of Baltimore County Public Schools. Those components are teaching and learning, operations, and culture in context. The purpose of their work is to ensure that we have a solid understanding of our areas of strength as a school district, as well as major challenges that we face. Part of their process includes the artifacts review. They are reviewing documents from every department. They are reviewing websites. They are reviewing our efficiency study. They are reviewing the blueprint, as well as other information provided from leadership in departments. They are conducting leadership interviews to find out from leaders of departments what the work is and what our expected services are for schools. And lastly, focus groups. Focus groups provide them with an opportunity to hear directly from additional stakeholders. This is where the parents come in, the teachers, other staff, content experts, end users, and external partners. They get to share directly with the committee members what their experiences are, what they view as areas of strength for Baltimore County, as well as remaining needs. The process will include review of feedback from all of the community meet and greet reports to inform the final report. And the product that we will receive sometime in August that we'll be sharing with Team BCPS is a user-friendly operational report, meaning this is our chart for us to do our work across Team BCPS. It will include the summary of their findings, short-term recommendations, actionable recommendations, as well as longer-term recommendations. Next slide, please. The question that all committee members are asking is how do we serve and support schools? They are looking at the current services that we provide, what is the current state, what is the desired state, and what's the gap in between. They are also asking questions from focus groups to find out how do we get there, and that is what is going to inform their recommendations that they provide to us three short-term recommendations and one to two long-term recommendations, also incorporating the work, for the feedback from our community from the meet and greets. The five co uh, committees are listed on the slide before you. They are infrastructure, culture and climate, operations, teaching and learning, and community engagement and communication. Next slide, please. Last night was number six of eight community meet and greets. These opportunities to hear directly from stakeholders are very valuable to me and to us as a school system. The three questions that we've asked everyone are on the slide. What is it that you find BCPS doing well that you want us to continue? What are your aspirations and hopes for Baltimore County Public Schools? And more importantly, what are two areas of improvement that you would like to see addressed immediately? I am grateful that so many stakeholders have been open and honest to share their direct feedback with us. We are listening and we are working to ensure that we're moving forward with actions that respond to your needs. Next slide, please. Moving forward, we believe in embracing all of our stakeholders. The community meet and greets is just one way that we are reaching out to our stakeholders. We are engaging stakeholders in authentic collaboration and empower them, empowering them to speak their truth so we can move forward and excel as a system. There are also opportunities to engage in this work 
internally with internal stakeholders across Team BCPS. In a few slides, I will share some of our additional community, community engagement measures where we are working across departments to hear directly from staff members about what their needs are, what the challenges, but more importantly, to empower them at the table so they can share how they think we should be problem solving and moving forward. Next slide, please. Our goal in the immediate is to fast forward. We know that time is of the essence. We must all work together to prioritize the success of Team BCPS. What I have been encouraged to hear in all of our meet and greets are the problems and the challenges that members of Team BCPS, external and internal, are raising are in alignment with these four identified priorities. Academic achievement, infrastructure, safety and climate, as well as making sure that we are both recruiting and retaining highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff. More specific information is to come in the, in the weeks and months to follow. Next slide, please. Again, as I stated before, the community meet and greets are just one way that we are trying to stay connected to members of Team BCPS. On this slide in front of you, you'll see the web page. Uh, there is a superintendent web page now with a plethora of information, including a specific message, information about the fast forward plan, and more information about our transition team, and specifically our community engagement opportunities, where you have an opportunity to see the several meetings that we have scheduled for throughout the summer and uh, some of the framework for our meetings throughout the year. We want to continue to hear directly from members of Team BCPS as we move forward with plans and move forward with implementation. We will be seeking your direct feedback on how we're doing. We also want you to be a part of sharing how we can solve the problems and tell us how we're doing. Next slide, please. And finally, a message that have, I have shared in every single meeting and I will continue to share as we move forward is that we are all united in one purpose, and that is to meet the needs of all of our students across Team BS, Team, I'm sorry, across Team BCPS. It is important that we have students, community members, parents, guardians, and staff all working together to meet our students' need. I look forward to continued opportunities to engage and really thank you in advance for partnering with us on behalf of our 111,000 students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Um, next on the agenda is chair report, and that is me. This is an exciting Board of Education meeting for us as Dr. Yarbrough attends her first meeting as superintendent of BCPS. On behalf of the board, we are excited and thrilled that you are in this seat and that you are leading our system. Thank you to those who have attended one of the Meet the Superintendent events. We appreciate having staff, students, parents, politicians, and other community members in attendance to listen to Dr. Yarbrough discuss her key priorities for the upcoming school year, as well as hear the thoughts and views of the community. There is another session tomorrow night at Towson High School, and next Tuesday will be the eighth session at Randallstown High School. Both sessions are from 6 to 7 o'clock. We're also excited to welcome Kayla Drummond as our newest student member of the board, and she will be with us next month. We are looking forward to her leadership and her ensuring that the voice of students stays in the forefront of our work as a board. The enthusiasm for Ms. Drummond was obvious at her swearing-in ceremony last week. In addition to her very proud family, the principal of Parkville and other staff members attended, and they were beaming with pride. So again, congratulations, Ms. Drummond, and we're looking forward to working with you. We're also excited to welcome our 12th and final Board of Education member, uh, Ms. Felicia Stolesky, back to the board. She was a board member in 2022, filling in for Delegate Pasteur, who had resigned to run for state delegate. Her experience as a middle school teacher and substitute teacher will continue to bring the teacher's voice to decision making. So welcome back to the board. 
So after seven months, we are a full board. And I want to take the time to thank my fellow board members for their work. I want to thank you for what you do to ensure our success as a board and our success as a school system. The public sees our participation during these meetings and at various community events, but they don't see the behind the scenes work that each of you does. Thank, all, thank you for all you do to prepare for these meetings as well as the committee meetings. You each are on multiple committees and the productivity of those committees is due to your due diligence in preparing and participating. I also want to thank members for asking thoughtful and relevant questions and for requesting additional information to make certain that we are amply prepared to make decisions that will affect our students, families, and staff. I am so proud of our ability to work together whether we agree with each other or whether we are pushing back on one another. We are working together, and for that I am grateful. And finally, thank you to all of our staff who are part of summer school. As educators, we are fortunate to have many new years. The start of summer school this week is one of those new starts. It is obvious that staff puts in much thought and work to ensuring that summer school is meeting the needs of our students while also allowing them to experience activities that enrich and engage. Thank you to all who are participating in that at this time. And that is the end of my board report. So thank you. And let me switch gears to our next agenda item, which is the next item on the agenda is unfinished business consideration of board policies. This is the second reader for these policies. And for that, I call Ms. Christina Pumphrey, chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you, Chair Lichter. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Board Policy 0600, Basic Board Commitments, Anti-Discrimination. Board Policy 5000, Students, Students. Board Policy 5330, Students, Activities, Student Engagement. Board Policy 6002, Instruction, Selection of Instructional Materials. Board Policy 8315, Participation by the Public. Board Policy 8400, Office of Internal Audit. Board Policy 8410, Reporting Fraud, Waste, Abuse, or Unlawful Act. Board Policy 8420, Anti-Retaliation. Board Policy 8430, Audit Committee. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit J. Thank you. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 0600, 5000, 5330, 6002, 8315, 8400, 8410, 8420, and 8430. So moved, Hen. Thank you, Ms. Hen. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion at this time? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frampal? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the Central and Northeast Area Middle School Boundary Study Recommendation and Impact Study. And for that, I call on Mr. Dixit and Mr. Taylor. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Pete Dixon. I'm executive director for facilities management and street planning. I'm joined here with me is Mr. Taylor, who's the director of, of strategic planning. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Yarbrough, and members of the board. We are here to seek board approval on the recommendation of the Central and Northeast Area Middle School Boundary Study. On May 2nd, the Board of Education received for consideration a report from the Central and Northeast Area Middle School Boundary Study Committee. Uh, I have already shared the names of the schools, so I'll go to the recommended option E was voted on by the committee who engaged in a process of data collection, analysis, and community engagement. A board hearing on the recommended boundary change was held on May 17, 2023. In the meeting on June 13th, the board postponed the vote 
until an impact analysis could be provided on the proposed change of moving the entire Halstead Academy attendance area to Dumbarton Middle School instead of Lock Raven Technical Academy. We are here to present the findings of that uh, action, and Mr. Taylor is going to go over a PowerPoint presentation. Also, uh, virtually, Mr. Uh, Matthew Cropper is available to answer any questions. So, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Can I have the next slide, please? As Mr. Dixit mentioned, on May 2nd, the committee recommendation of option E was presented to the board, and the hearing was held on May 17th. On June 13th, the board agreed to defer voting on the final boundary to analyze the impact of proposal to modify option E so that Halstead Academy Elementary School attendance area would go to Dunbarton Middle School instead of Lock Raven Middle School. This modification to option E we are identifying as option E1. Next slide, please. There are two maps on this slide. Um, the red line represents the Halstead Academy attendance area. On the left side is how that attendance area was treated in option E. It is colored purple because that was going to Lock Raven Academy. On the right side map, we show option E1, and it shades the Halstead attendance area in tan or green. It's not purple. Um, and that indicates that it's going to Dumbarton. So we have this map just to show in a zoom-in version of the area so you can see what neighborhoods are affected by this. Next slide, please. This is a summary of the key impacts of the proposed option E1. With regard to enrollment and utilization, Dumbarton Middle School option E had the enrollment at 932 and the estimated utilization would be 84%. Option E1 had the enrollment at Dumbarton increased to 1,136 with a utilization of 102%. With regard to Lock Raven Middle School, estimated enrollment under option E was 796 and utilization 84%. Option E1, enrollment went down 592 and utilization went down to 63%. With regard to demographics, racial population, with regard to option E at Dumbarton Middle School, the white po student population was 57% and the black student population is 22%. Under option one, the WAP white population goes down to 45%, and the black population goes up to 32%. And with Lock Raven, under option E, the white student population was at 19%, the black student population was 61%. And under option E1, the white population went up 24%, and the black population down to 54%. With regard to how many students were impacted by this change, under option E, a total of 1,625 students would be impacted, moved. Under option E, one, 1,817 students would be moved. Next slide, please. This slide repeats the enrollment utilization comparison, but puts it in context with the other schools for your reference. The same, it's the same information. Next slide, please. These tables have more detailed demographics, has the same information that I provided outlined by the red boxes, but it also includes the other schools, and you can also see the uh, changes in Asian, multiracial, Hispanic, but also farms and ELL students. Next slide, please. This just uses the same table that we had in the major report where the red outline is, shows the differences with regard to the number of students that were moved. And the last slide, please. Next slide. And this is a feeder pattern comparison 
again, looking at the red outline, it shows how the uh, feeders are different from the middle school to the high schools with these changes. Option E in the middle and option E1 on the right. Thank you. Now we are here to answer any questions you might have. So I'm going to ask for the motion and then we'll have the discussion. So do I have a motion to approve option E for the central and northeast area middle school boundary? So, so moved, Ms. Humphrey. Second, Hen. Okay. So first, Ms. Pumphrey, second, Ms. Hen. Okay, now, is there um, any discussion? Ms. Pumphrey? Thank you. I would like to reiterate that I recognize and appreciate the hard work that was done by the Boundary Study Committee. My motion to amend Map E at the last board meeting was not a criticism of the committee. I said from the beginning that we should trust the process. It is the duty of the board to use its due diligence to ensure that all communities are heard. If the board feels that amendments are needed to a map, this is also part of the process. After the public hearing regarding the boundary study recommendation, I was provided information that indicated that a group in one community may have been misrepresented or unheard during this process. I felt it was my duty to ensure this group was indeed heard and their opinion was taken into consideration. Because the new Northeast Middle School will not open for over a year, I feel it was not detri detrimental to students to take the extra time needed to be sure that we are making the right decision. At, be at the beginning of this boundary study, we also heard from members of the community who felt that they were not fully included because elementary schools were not part of the boundary study process. Advocates for these communities came together and analyzed data and maps to make recommendations to the committee they felt would be in the best interest of all communities. Through this boundary study, we have learned that changes are needed in the boundary study process. The board was provided with a graph that showed the number of survey responses from each middle school. Those responses, along with the number of stakeholders from each community who attended meetings throughout the process, clearly showed differences in the number of responses from each community. The distinction was quite clear. We need to be intentional about reaching families and communities who are often unheard for whatever reason. I understand that some parents and guardians cannot attend these meetings or may not be able to complete the surveys for various reasons. However, I refuse to believe that these parents don't care or that we can't find another way. We need to meet families where they are with the tools that are available to them. We need to reinforce how important it is for them to be involved, speak up for what they believe is in the right interest, in, in the best interest of their children, and we need to reinforce that their opinions matter. We need to find unique ways to reach these families because everyone's situation is different. For students who truly do not have anyone to speak up for their best interest, we need to ensure that there is an advocate in their community who will speak on their behalf. Now that we have the results of the impact study and now that I feel confident that the opinions of all communities were considered, I feel that Map E with no amendments is the best option for all students involved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. Other discussion from board members? Ms. Hen? Yes, um, thank you, Ms. Pumphrey, for those remarks. I want to also reiterate my appreciation for the work of the Boundary Study Committee. Um, if it's been said that the board has thankless work, but it's nothing compared to the work of um, this group of volunteers. These are our principals that attend meetings after long hours in their, their schools, um, and it truly is thankless work. So please know we appreciate your efforts. We appreciate the work of the community members who came together to collaborate and who compromised um, on Map E. So I support this recommendation, I support the committee, and thank you and thank staff and thank Cropper for their work as well. Um, this is a process I've frequently cited as exemplary for BCPS in terms of both transparency and community involvement. I'm proud of this process, I'm proud of the committee for their recommendation and for the hard work of staff that's gone into it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Other discussion from board members? Ms. Frampong? Mm. So, um, the numbers went up by 204 students in one slide and 192 were moved. Can you talk about where the numbers came from? That's not just fifth graders, correct? Are you talking about the students, number of students that were moved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the number of students in that block, in that attendance area, that would go to one school versus another. Okay, so that includes students that are not necessarily in fifth grade now, because that's, it's, you're saying it's the entire school. It, it's not It's not the, I'm not sure I'm hearing you correctly, mm -hmm. but it's not the elementary school at all. It's the middle school students who live in that area. So you did the numbers based on the current middle school? Yes. Okay. okay. And then I have a question about the survey. So I don't know if this is for you or Mr. Cropper. You said is 
like on the line. So the survey that was done, and there were 2,700 some responses to that survey. And then the maps or the pie graphs of those four um, options were given to the committee. And so from that survey, 80%, over 80% of the responses came from just four middle school communities. So was that information provided to the committee at that time? Yes, all the information was provided to the committee. And the committee still chose to move forward knowing that there were 80% of responses from just four middle schools. The committee moved forward with the information that we provided to them. And we provided all of the input from the community, the survey, emails, um, we had a comment section. So all of the information was provided to the committee. Okay. When was the committee told about the 80% from because the representation of the committee is two per school. So that's an even distribution. But then in the survey, there's 11 different categories as far as people who can respond. The 10 middle schools and then other. And so the overwhelming, again, over 80% of the 2,700 came from just four communities. So that leaves less than 20% from the other communities that were involved in the survey. So when was that information provided to the committee? It was provided the a day or two after the survey closed because it's all electronic and as soon as we get it then we send it out by email we have all the committee members emails okay other other questions or comments miss booker dwyer so i definitely appreciate the committee's work on um on this on the boundary study and i appreciate the parents who provided input. It's clear that not all parents were had the opportunity to provide input. And I could not, in good conscience, vote in favor of a map where, well, number one, with option E1, um, that would intentionally overcrowd a school. And I cannot vote in favor of a, a map that did not include the voices of all parents and that appears to limit diversity. And so, um, so I will be voting no on this today. Thank you. Other comments, or Ms. Dominowski? Um, I just wanted to reiterate a lot of the comments that were already made. Um, this was brought up very early on that um, all the elementary schools were not involved in this process. And we were told it's not policy. I agree that this policy needs to be looked at again. And we should be including all elementary schools and communications. But those parents and the community members were told this process is moving on, we're, trust the process, come to the meetings, make your comments. It was up to us as board members to get our communities involved and to let them be aware of what's going on. Let them know you can, you can, you can submit your comments, you can submit your support, this is how you do it. That's on us. And it's on us to listen to our communities and they're telling us this is what they want, option E. The committee members, voted on option E over 60%. That included all 11 middle schools that were represented there and no elementary schools. Um, the, the survey that went out to the public was 70% was for this option E. And the options that included all the middle, the, um, the elementary, the Halstead going to Dumbarton was only 9% for, and mo like most, was most were opposed to it. And the, every email I have received, every Every person that has contacted me doesn't want this move. They want their kids to go to Lock Raven Academy. They don't want to split up their neighborhoods. I don't know how I, as a member of the community, can tell another community that I know better than, than them. So I'm voting for option E. Thank you. Other board member comments or questions? Okay, may I have, oh. Yeah, I have one more thing to say. Okay, one more thing. Yeah. So. Um, I'm concerned with the response that I heard that the committee was aware that um, from the survey that over 80% came from just four schools. I know the question was asked about did all of the schools participate in the survey and the response was yes and that's accurate. But that specifically again that 80% um, came from just four communities, that information was not provided to the committee. And I'm speaking as a member 
who was on the committee. There was no email, and that was information was not provided at the meetings. So um, I guess that's just a point of, of disagreement there, but I do believe that the committee acted in good faith. That was the point of having equal representation from all the schools, and everybody was trying to make sure that everybody's voice was heard. Thank you, Ms. Domanowski. Um, I'd like to make a motion to remove Ms. Um, Pumphrey from this vote, as she's already said that she was on the committee. Not Ms. Pumphrey. Ms. Pumphrey. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Ms. Frempalm. Um, Ms. Frempalm from this vote, since she's um, brought herself out as being on that committee that that, rec that you know voted on this, I don't think it's fair that you get double votes um, on this right now. Do you want to respond to that, Ms. Frempalm? We need a second. Oh, like oh I'm sorry, Ms. Domanowski made a motion. Is there a second for Ms. Domanowski's motion? I have a comment. I'll second it for discussion um, purposes, but I'd like to give Ms. Frempong the opportunity to recuse herself without board action. Mm, okay. That's fine. Thank you for that. And so I'm willing to consider that recusal if uh, board member Domanowski will also recuse herself because she's directly impacted by having three children that are going to be affected by the boundary study. No. That doesn't, I mean, all of our kids go to school in public school, I, I would assume, so it affects all of them. And I'm making this decision because my commi my community said that this is what they want. I'm not going against what they're asking me to do. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hen, did you want to speak? No, did you say you wanted to speak to something? I was willing, I seconded oh. Ms. Domanowski's okay. motion. All right, may I have a, okay, so. Chair, unless Ms. Frempong would reconsider. I would prefer if it's her decision as board member to recuse based on her involvement on the committee. Correct, and I, I gave my answer. So um, it's not that everybody on this board is directly impacted by their children in this particular boundary study. Yours are though. Again, I'm not making a, I'm not trying to amend a, a, a motion that, or amend a map against what my community is asking me to do. This is what my community has come forward and with Perry Hall, with Dumbarton, with Locker even, made this decision together. It would be another thing if I was trying to change something that they recommended to me and I'm not, so. Can I respond? Am I able to respond? So this board represents 111,000 students and so the thing is just what you said. Those were four of the schools that were predominant in the survey over 80 percent and so I'm bringing attention to the fact that there's multiple voices and so there's nothing wrong with trying to represent 111 students and be a voice for everyone I'm an appointed member I don't represent a specific area according to board guidance board legal guidance a motion can't be made to ask a board member to recuse themselves. That is a board member's option. Is that correctly stated? There we go. For the record, Darren Burns, board council. Specifically, the advice I give is that by vote, the, the, the board members cannot compel a member to recuse themselves. So I guess theoretically, a board could, could have a motion seconded and voted on to make a request but I just want to make it clear that that would not compel the member to recuse themselves. That is ultimately the member's choice. So then at this point, are we voting on Ms. Domanowski's motion, Mr. Burns? First, before we do motion, uh, option E vote. I would recommend that the motion be restated uh, for the record. And Madam Chair, I would like to withdraw my second um, for the reason that Mr. Burns had mentioned. Um, it was clear that we would be asking, not compelling. However, because that is a gray area, I don't feel comfortable seconding it. I did feel comfortable with making the request of Ms. Frempong, which I did, and she has stated her position. So I withdraw my second. Thank you. Ms. Domanowski, do I you want to restate? I, I can withdraw my motion. Okay. And, let, and I, I mean, all, all the evidence, is, all the facts are out there. So I'll, I can withdraw okay. my motion and let Mrs. Uh, Frempong make her vote the okay. way she sees fit. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote on the motion to approve option E for the Central and Northeast mm -hmm. Area Middle School Boundary? Ms. Domanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? No. Ms. Dulesky? Abstain. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. 
Dr. Savoy. Dr. Wait Savoy. Abstain. Mr. McMillian. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer. No. Ms. Lichter. Yes. Favor is six. So the motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. For that, I call on Mr. Burns. Madam Chair, Dr. Yarborough, members of the board, for the record, I'm Darren Burns, board counsel. I'm here before you just to summarize um, that the board, uh, as part of its closed session agenda, considered four appeals uh, on, motion, on a summary affirmance basis, and those appeal numbers were HE 23-10, HE 23-24, HE 23-30, and HE 23-31. The board considered the record of each appeal in full and took action, and at this time, it's up to the board to adopt its action. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's cases HE 2310, 2324, 2330, and 2331, and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So move, Pumphrey. Thank you. Is there a second? Second hand. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call Mr. Young, Vice Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Members of the board. The Board's Building and Contracts Committee met on Monday, July 10, 2023. During the meeting, items, item M10 was removed at the request of staff. Items M1, M2, M4 through M9, and M11 through M22 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Item M3 is being brought to the full board without a recommendation from the committee. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve items M1, M2, M4 through M9, M11 through M22. So moved. Thank Ms. you, Ms. Han. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve item M3? So moved, Booker Dwyer. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, from Pong. Thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, earlier today, I submitted questions on this particular contract to staff if they are available to respond to those. Dr. Yarbrough. Ms. Hen, thank you for that. Uh, earlier today, additional questions were received after the responses were sent from yesterday's questions. Um, I think staff might have uh, the answer to maybe the first two questions, but there's not been enough time to sure. receive the answers. Of course. At this time, I'll ask Mr. Agosto and Mr. Hartlove to please come forward, and Ms. Webster. Thank you. Good evening. Ms. Hen, would you like to pose the question? So They're, they're lengthy. Um, good evening, Mr. Hartlow, Mr. Good Gusto, evening. Ms. Webster. Um, if you wouldn't mind reading my questions and responding to those that you feel prepared to answer. Um, we, di we did respond to the questions from last night. I don't know if you were discussing those. The other questions we have not, we've looked at, but we haven't had a chance to dive into those. Sure. I'll, I'll narrow it down to the, the one issue of concern, and that is the 
um, implement, I'm sorry, one-time subscription costs per module. And if we would be incurring those prior to implementation of those modules um, at a cost of $2 million, or whether or not we would just be paying for those modules as they are implemented. Um, there's a difference in those two structures of about $3 million. So if you have that information. I think, um, we'll speak for Mr. Augusto. I don't know if you have that information. Well, that's a, uh, the, the cost, um, the licensing cost, as you're talking about, is really on the oh, procurement side. And we discussed this with the uh, vendor today, um, and we're, the discount that we were offered on the cost includes payment upfront for all modules. And do do we know what the payment for the individual modules would be compared to what? We are paying because it's my understanding that this is a multi-year implementation, as is common. So I want to ensure the the public that we're not paying for something we don't need prior to we need us needing it. It's a significant investment, and we should be paying just for those modules we are implementing unless we're receiving substantial discount on the bundle. We, we are paying only for the modules that we intend to implement. Oh, sorry. <laughs> In, intend to implement, which is why I had asked for the implementation schedule, Mr. Gosser. Yeah, I can speak to the, so the implementation schedule. So here's the, the issue with the implementation schedule. So as provided by the vendor, um, as you're well aware, when a vendor provides their, uh, their solicit, or the response to solicitation, there are certain assumptions that are based. They put their schedule based on the requirements laid out in the RFP. So typically, upon contract award, the very first thing that we would do with the vendor is work with them, finalize, um, validate any assumptions in their proposal, and finalize that schedule. So whereas we have a timeline, a proposed um, implementation plan that runs through um, July, June of 2025, we would work with the vendor to determine which modules go in which order and, and fine tune that uh, schedule. So I, I, the question you were asking were for a detailed plan. I, I can't provide that until we have that vendor on board in the August timeframe. That's the very first thing that we'll do. Understand, and I don't wanna um, drag into asking for more details. Yeah. Um, that's not necessary, but with a $27 million spending authority that's requested, I would feel more comfortable that this board has done its due diligence approving, say, the initial year of the implementation with those known costs. Have you come back, review how the implementation is going, and request what is needed for subsequent years? My concern is that we we are being asked to approve, which is the only board's governance um, tool to approve the $27 million without a plan, and seeing that there are significant costs per module we're talking a multi-year implementation, even with right. if things go perfectly on schedule um, of 2025. So, well, I'll uh, I'll speak to this and I'll let Ms. Webster chime in. Um, it, just to assure the board, the um, implementation costs. So the the contract is a firm fixed price contract based on deliverables. So payment to the vendor is going to be based on the delivery and submission of agreed upon deliverables and a approval of those deliverables by BCPS. So it's not a, a blank check for full implementation costs. They actually have to deliver before they're paid. Including the um, flat subscription fee? The subscription fee is a subscription fee. Um, that's going to be based on what we're acquiring at that point in time. But the second piece of that, that it, that rolls up to the full $27 million or five years is the one-time implementation cost, which is going to be on a deliverable-based payment structure. Great. So these systems are desperately needed. I'm, I'm well yes. aware of that, and we need to move forward, and we sh should not delay on this. I would just request that Dr. Yarbrough uh, updates on an annual basis if those could be scheduled so that this board can be remain in tune with the progress um, considering the sizable investment. Thank you. Sure. 
Yes, uh, thank you for that. Um, thank you for affirming that these are critical resources that across Team BCPS. This system in particular touches all 20,000 staff members and every staff member that we're trying to recruit, everything from payroll to human resources to our data and making sure all of our systems talk. This is going to be a game changer for us. And so absolutely with the request in terms of uh, providing an update to the board, but I think what will speak even louder to that is you hear the services that everyone is uh, receiving, including yourselves, on the payroll side as board members. So thank you for that. Any other further discussion on M3? Yes, Ms. Frampong. So I have a question. Um, Julie had, or board member Hen had raised um, some really good points and questions um, and the meeting from yesterday. And, um, one of the questions that she had also asked about what was the ramifications of, right, if we don't make this decision. Right. And so I heard you speak about, well, that's impacting further down the road. So like July 25th or July of 2025, we may have some issues. So I understand why we need to make a decision and it's important that we make the decision. But when you talk about project planning, my question is how much time is given for like this approval or procurement process because mm. if a budget meeting is just held yesterday and then questions come up that may impact the contract is there really enough time then to get the answers get the information we need before it comes to us as a full board and then we have to make a decision so how much time is really allotted even in just planning for the procurement process to make sure that i guess there's enough vetting and um, research or whatever needed to answer questions for board members before this comes before us at kind of like such a critical moment. I can speak to the entire process timeline okay. of the solicitation. Mm -hmm. We started gathering information for this nine months ago. Okay. So, but it just came, I don't know, did, because I'm not part of the community, I ended up watching it, but this, did this just come before the contracts committee yesterday? Is it contracts? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. The contracts committee yesterday, so there's really only one day as far as that timetable. So that's more so what I'm talking to, between the information getting to the board committee and having an, enough time to, to digest and research and get questions answered before it comes to the full board for approval. I believe, and this, this is an I believe, I believe that the exhibits are provided to you a week prior to the board meeting. Okay. Cor correct, yes. I'm seeing lots of head okay. nods. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ms. Frimpong, if I may add to that question, thank you very much for these um, uh, questions about process. And as Ms. Webster said, um, but number one, I think all members of Team BCPS are well aware of our uh, extreme needs in the area of infrastructure. And our process is a very well vetted process that includes many steps, um, you know, that we are to abide by based on uh, policy and rule. And so as Ms. Webster said, nine months of vetting members from all of the uh, divisions that are going to be impacted, including human resources, payroll, uh, information technology, have been, a point, uh, have been a part of giving feedback. And then we follow the normal board process in terms of putting uh, the information a week ahead being posted on board docs okay. to give an opportunity um, for people to identify what those questions are. So then we go to committee first, and then we bring it to the full board. That's in alignment with our established process. Absolutely open to moving forward. If there's a, a different preferred way to make uh, different choices, we can absolutely be open to having those conversations. But this is a, a nine month in the making, but really two years um, in terms of widespread conversations about the needs for member of Team BCPS to move forward. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. I really appreciate Ms. Frempong's question and comments regarding the timing. Um, this has been a challenge. I've served on the Building and Contracts Committee since 2016 when I got on the board and having to make those decisions and, and it's not easy on staff either because you're being asked to respond to our questions in short order with no time to turn that around. I think we do need to look at the process and perhaps like policies stagger 
um, the contracts that are brought to us for approval to the following meeting and to have more lead time both for board members to review as well as for staff to respond to the questions. Um, looking back, I think it was appropriate to pause on the boundary study. I'm glad we um, were able to address those questions um, for board member Pumphrey and, and all of us. I mean, it applies, we, we each deserve that opportunity to do our due diligence. So I, I agree with Dr. Yarborough. I think we can look at the process, um, probably a con conversation for our board retreat, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. and that would um, make this go much more smoothly. So on staff and, and the board. And I'd, I'd just like to add that um, uh, Ms. Harvey's not here tonight, and Mr. Young, but Mr. Ms. Ms. Harvey and Mr. Young, we've been meeting as, as uh, the chair and vice chair of the Buildings and Contracts Committee with, along with Ms. Webster, um, to discuss formatting of the information, time, timing, and we've been, we've been having those discussions. So it's, it's, it is a bit of a work in progress. Um. Thank you. So at this point, may I have a roll call vote on the approval of item M3? Ms. Domanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Recuse. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Yes. Mr. M Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. The next item on the agenda is the considerations of a privately funded capital project request. And for that, I call on Mr. Mustafer. Good evening, Mr. Mustafer. Good evening, Chair Lichter. Chair Harvey, board members, Superintendent Yarborough, I'm here this evening to present the 7330 for the renovation of the Mays Burton Barn at Hereford High School. Preservation of this historic barn will boost community and school pride. The barn serves as a source of pride for the Hereford community and the restoration will enhance the physical attributes and delve deeper into the community's rural heritage. The renovation of the Mays Burton Barn will include a replacement of the metal roof, gutters, and downspout system. In addition, there will be other enhancement to firm up and beautify the structure. The project is funded by state grants, operating funds, and private donations from the community. We are asking for your approval to move forward with this very important project for the Hereford community. May I have, thank you for that. May I have a motion to approve the privately funded capital budget request for Hereford High School's Mays Burton Barn? So moved, Dominowski. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Hen. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the inclement weather day plan and school calendar. And for that, I call on Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you. I'm pleased to provide an update on Team BCPS responses to the inclement weather day survey and a recommendation for your consideration for this upcoming school year. The Maryland State Department of Education has provided a pathway for local education agencies to repurpose certain days as virtual school days in the 2023-2024 school year. The days may be considered including inclement weather days, staff professional learning days, high school graduation days to enable teachers to assist with or attend graduation, and other so similar circumstances. Next slide, please. Specifically, all school systems in Maryland have the opportunity to use a total of eight days as virtual school days for the described purposes. School systems that transition to virtual inclement weather days must attest to the following. No more than eight virtual days with a maximum of three asynchronous days, minimum of four hours of synchronous instruction for all students, Attendance must be taken for all students and teachers during the virtual days, including asynchronous days. Virtual days cannot negatively impact student grades, opportunities to make up work missed, 
must be provided. The virtual instructional plan must be posted on the school system's website and a virtual inclement weather day plan must be presented at a publicly accessible local school system board meeting like this evening. Next slide, please. We launched a survey in English and Spanish to gather feedback and input from Team BCPS in May. More than 11,000 stakeholders in BCPS responded for the 2023-2024 school year. Respondents included 39% staff, 52% parents, 9% students, and 1% community members. Results indicated the following. Traditional snow days are valued by students, staff, and families. Staff, students, and parents do not want the school year to extend beyond the last scheduled day of school. And lastly, staff, students, and parents are not in favor of reducing spring break or any other holidays to make up for inclement weather days. 80% of the BCPS community supported transition to virtual days after the use of the three traditional school snow days that were planned. Next slide, please. As a result of stakeholder feedback with board support, we would like to recommend the following for state approval. Days one through three, traditional inclement weather days. Day four and beyond, transition to virtual and high schools with 10 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. graduation ceremonies are provided with the opportunity for asynchronous learning to allow staff and student participation. May I have a motion to approve the inclement weather day plan and revise 2023-2024 school calendar? So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you, is there a second? Second from Pum. Thank you, thank you, any discussion? Ms. Dominowski? Yeah, I just, um, I'm, I'm not against this at all. I just, I know we've talked about it before about putting um, more uh, information or lesson plans or work for students on the website. And if we're able to do this ahead of time for inclement weather or for, you know, attending graduations or if teachers need, you know, instructional time, um, can we look at doing this more for students that need to have an extended absence from school so that they're not getting further behind because they can't get, you understand, I know we've talked about this. I think I know, you know what I'm saying. Yes, yes, Ms. Dominowski, you're referring to um, posting more information on Schoology as a uh, general practice. And we definitely have an opportunity July 18th and 19th when we're with our principals to share that information, to gather feedback from them about what is um, reasonable and what we can accommodate to meet the needs of uh, families moving forward. Ms. Booker Dwyer. So I just have one question about the survey, and, I, and this would just apply to Baltimore County surveys in general. What, what is the target survey response rate that Baltimore County aims to um, achieve when doing these types of things? Because when I think about like 20,000 staff and the number of families and the number of students, so is there a target response rate for us to say, okay, this survey truly reflected the Baltimore County community? So I'm not sure that I could say there's a targeted survey response rate, but what I can tell you is this is the third year in a row that we've administered the survey. So we've seen a, uh, you know, a, a dip from 30,000 respondents to 11,000 families, but all um, responding in the same way. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, so I support this plan and thank all those who worked on it. Um, it certainly seems very balanced and reasonable, and it's great to see the level of community support behind it. Um, my question is related to Ms. Domanowski's in that because no one knows when day four will hit or day, subsequent days, how, what supports will we provide to teachers to put those materials online, realizing that they will have last minute notice of, of an inclement weather day? Well, thank you for asking that question. Um, if you go to our website now and you see last year's plan and the year before, one of the ways that we provide teachers with this time, because there is not leeway, is we operate on, well, if we ever do it, we would operate on a two-hour delay schedule, and that gives the teachers the two hours that they need to sort of shift from the face-to-face -face classroom plan that they had to posting things online. And it also gives families the opportunity to know what time we need students to log in, particularly if you've been rusty for a while um, to test it on and to be in in class on time. Thank you for that. And I presume TABCO has Absolutely. endorsed this, this plan as well. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? 
May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Ms. Jaminowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempal? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the proposed magnet updates for the 2024-2025 school year. The Curriculum Committee asks that the Board approve the Committee's recommendation to approve the proposed magnet updates for the 2024-2025 school year. So may I have a motion to approve the magnet updates for the 2024-2025 school year? So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you. No second is needed as the recommendation comes from the Committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stoluski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the FY 2024 Office of Internal Audit Work Plan. And for that, I call on the chair of the Audit Committee, Mr. Rod McMillian. Members of the board. The Audit Committee asked the Board accept the Committee's recommendations to approve the FY 2024 Office of Internal Audit Work Plan. The work plan is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit Q. Thank you. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Audit Committee to approve the FY 2024 Office of Internal Audit Work Plan? So moves to Lusky. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the Committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Tomanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempal? Yes. Ms. Stoluski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. <coughs> Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. She said yes. Oh, thank you. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. The next item on the agenda is the report on the quarter four audit report. And for that, I call on Ms. Barr, who <laughs> is already there. Thank you. Good evening. In fiscal year 2023, the Office of Internal Audit began to use audit ratings and issue ratings for work plan audits. Audit rating definitions are attributes used to identify the overall aggregate level of risk to the audited area. Satisfactory is the highest audit rating that can be achieved. Needs improvement indicates that overall conditions in the audited area are generally acceptable. I would like to note that a needs improvement audit rating is not negative. I'd like to, like to stress that. However, an unsatisfactory rating is the lowest audit rating that an audited area can, can receive. It is indicative that immediate corrective action is required. However, overall, how the management team responds with an action plan to improve processes is more important than the audit rating. During FY23, we completed six, six high-risk audits, the summer payroll process, the ESOL registration enrollment process, the student enrollment process and data accuracy, MSDE certification process, maintenance of student data, and records management. Three medium-risk audits, contracts, agreements, and leases, magnet program admissions, student residency, and shared domicile. That was actually combined with the student enrollment process for the report. And two low-risk audits, homeschool program and the SRO program. In summary, six of the 11 audits received a satisfactory rating. They were the MSDE certification process, the maintenance of student data, uh, records management, contracts, leases, and agreements, magnet program admissions, and the homeschool program. Three audits received needs improvement. That was the manual summer payroll process, the ESOL registration and enrollment process, and the SRO program. And we did have two audits that received an unsatisfactory rating, and that was the student enrollment process and data accuracy and the student residency and shared domicile. And as I mentioned, that was included in one report. And all these reports have been posted to our website. At the end, on June 30, we had five audits that were in various stages of the audit process. Two were in planning. That was the CTE accreditation and the special education dispute, dispute resolution audit. 
We had one in field work, which was the health services program, and two in reporting stages, the IT security and the use of facilities. We also had to defer six projects to subsequent work plan years. Those um, audits that were deferred were the recruitment, hiring, and retention processes for certificated staff, hiring processes for temporary employees for summer programs and substitutes, the employee wellness program, the discrimination claims process and ADA accommodations, school safety measure program, and bus routes. However, in FY23, we did complete two or three unplanned projects. One was the Office of Third Party Billing, where we assisted uh, the staff with self-monitoring and also the verification of the student member of the board voting results. We had one open um, unplanned project, and that was the audit of overpayment to members of union and non-represented groups, but that is in the final reporting stage. Also new in FY23 is the way we are tracking issues. Um, that information can be found on pages 6 through 11 of the year-end update document. We will follow up with management to determine the status of their corrective action plans based on the estimated completion date noted in their corrective action plan. This tracking uh, information and status updates will be provided to the audit committee on a quarterly basis and to the board as part of the annual year-end report. With respect to investigations, we had 150 open cases during FY23. 137 of them were received last year and 13 carried over from FY22. For the cases in FY23, 38 remained in the Office of Internal Audit and 26 were closed. 11 were considered to be management investigations and five of those were closed. 88 were not in the purview of the Office of Internal Audit and 87 were closed with a memo to file. Of the 26 closed cases investigated by internal audit, seven were substantiated, five were inconclusive, and 14 were unsubstantiated. Of the five closed by management, one was inconclusive, and four were unsubstantiated. At June 30th, we had 118 closed cases and 32 that would remain open or in process. Of those 26 that um, internal audit investigations that were closed, Six were related to conflict of interest, two, employee behavior, three, falsification of records, two were management issues, three were misuse of company property or resources, seven were related to payroll fraud or overtime abuse, two were related to procurement and purchasing practices. The management investigations closed, two were related to management issues, two, residency, and one student issue, and the memos to file were related to conflict of interest, employee behavior, um, information seeking no allegation made, management issues, misuse of company property or resources, payroll fraud or overtime abuse, and student issues. And I just wanted to let the board know and the audit committee know that we plan to resume our historical trend data and reporting that related to investigations beginning in September. Also of note, we did turn one case over to the Baltimore County State's Attorney's Office uh, last year, and additionally, three investigations that we completed last year may require us to audit areas that were not originally planned for FY24. And we would like to take this opportunity to thank the superintendent, superintendent cabinet, all management and staff for your cooperation and assistance throughout the year. We truly appreciate your time and all those who assisted us last year. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Barr at this time? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is, an, is informational items, including the board policy schedule for review in 2023-2024, a report on CCBC college readiness, the financial report for the month ending May 2023, the FY 2024 capital budget schedule, meeting minutes from the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council, policy editing, editing conventions for 23-24, the questions and answers on appeals and hearings handbook, the revised superintendent's rules 52-50, a report on suspensions climate, whoops, whoops, a report on suspensions climate and culture, and an update on the grading and reporting manual.
The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and board member comments and agenda setting. Um, so first is committee updates. Mr. McMillian, you had a lot already on tonight. Do you have other updates? Just very briefly, at the June meeting, we discussed the maintenance of student data audit report, the MSDE certifications and maintenance audit report, and we received an investigations update. Our next meeting is scheduled for September 19th, 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Manowski, the Budget Committee, any updates? I, I don't have any Budget Committee updates right now. Okay, thank you. Mr. Young, Building and Contracts? No additional updates. Thank you. Um, Dr. Savoy, Equity Committee? And Ms. Pumphrey, anything further about Policy and Review Committee? Nothing Hello. further. Well, Hello, uh, I'm here. Okay, do you have any Equity Committee updates? Yes. On June 10th, the Equity Committee met, and the biggest takeaway was parent engagement. Research revealed that parent engagement is closely linked to better student behavior, higher academic achievement, and enhanced social skills. When parents are engaged, it is more likely that children and adolescents will avoid unhealthy behaviors such as risky sexual behaviors and drug use. Schools can and should establish a shared vision for family engagement that includes the values of trust, relationships, partnerships, collaboration, inclusion, and equity. From this, expectations and goals should be created, not only for elementary school parents, and that's the norm, but for middle and high school parents as well. We also talked about the SAT scores and SAT prep, and their, um, the prep and how they um, enhance student scores. Now, also, there is, okay, that's for another time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Savoy. <laughs> okay. Ms. Ms. Pumphrey, anything for policy review? Nothing additional, but just to thank Ms. Howie and staff for um, thoughtfully uh, scheduling the policies for re review throughout the year. It was very helpful to me um, and for them to navigate which we could get through in a certain amount of time. I think it was very um, efficient, so thank you. Thank you. Do any board members have any comments or are agenda items they'd like um, to mention at this point? Ms. Domanowski? I just want to be really quick. I want to thank every single person that was involved in the Central and Northeast Boundaries Middle School study. I think it highlighted some um, negatives and some, posi some positives and some negatives, I should say. Um, I, I would like us to look at the policy um, involving feeder schools when we do middle school boundary studies. But um, given everything that they had to work with, we all had to work with, I feel confident that this board made the right decision in improving Map E. And moving forward, I would like to see us um, you know, come together and, and make decisions that are based on the majority of what our community and committee members have asked for. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board members have comment or agenda item? Ms. Booker Dwyer? I have uh, one comment. So I wanna um, take this time to thank Principal Webb at Sudbrook Middle Magnet School. Um, I had the opportunity to view summer learning at that school and um, I learned all about scatter plots and ratio and proportions and I got to see some really great things that they are doing for um, multilingual learners there. So um, I just appreciate him and his staff for being so welcoming and the students were just so engaged um, in, in that building. So um, I just wanted to let Mr. Webb acknowledge him publicly. Thank you and thank you for visiting that program. Any other members? Ms. Hen? Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to begin by congratulating again and thanking those appointees who are stepping into new leadership roles. Um, I appreciate you stepping up and being willing to, to take on those roles um, and look forward to hearing about your progress in, in those positions. Um, I want to, again, follow Ms. Domanowski and say thank you to the Boundary Study um, Committee, this, to staff, um, to board members for the rich discussion. Um, I think our engagement, again, we may not always agree, but the engagement is fantastic to see, and I appreciate all of the conversation. I appreciate board members I reached out to individually who took the time to speak with me about it. Um, it's been a long nine-month process, but I think um, we did the right thing. I'm pleased with option E passing at um, the recommendation of the committee and appreciate the dialogue. Lastly, I want to thank Dr. Yarborough and her team for the community engagement sessions. Um, I've received only positive feedback from those, and I think hearing that it's just the beginning is music to my ears because community engagement is so very critical. And um, listening will impact and drive our culture, and that culture 
that needs to needs to permeate throughout Team BCPS so that we are truly acting as one team um, with our community. So I'm very pleased you're where you are and thank you for your, your outreach. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Ms. Frumpong, did I see your hand up or somebody's? I did, but um, so I had comments on some of the information items. Can I speak on those? I think so. Is um, Go ahead. Okay. So uh, for item number one, S1, uh, for board policy scheduled for review, as part of the um, PRC, we had put forth, these are the um, policies that will be reviewed in the upcoming school year, and um, I had wanted to add policy 8601 to that um, to that schedule. So Ms. Pumphrey's taking notes right now. <laughs> I'm just making note of that. She had, okay. she spoke about that one. And then um, item S5. So that is the minutes from the Southeast Area Advisory Council meeting. And so I wanted to speak to some of the items that are in there. Um, it's not typically a report that's read. Mm -hmm. um, it's just included as, as information. But um, Jackie Brewster is the chair of that, and so I just wanted to highlight some of the items from that report. Um, so they had their planning meeting, and the advisories do a lot. Um, there's been comments, I know, public comment as far as, like, where are they or do we see them? Um, but advisories, they're very busy behind the scene and um, they're very involved. So things from the calendar committee, planning for equity advisory council, meeting the superintendent, safe and supportive environments, reopening stakeholder meetings, et cetera. Advisories are very involved. Um, but specific to Southwest, um, wanted to talk about there's a pest infestation at Patapsco High School that they are continuing to deal with. So just bringing um, attention to that as well as a continued discussion about when is the hollow bird and Norbert separation going to occur. This is a school that has fourth and fifth graders together um, with middle school. And according to our My I Pass, the fourth and fifth graders should be back at Norwood. Um, so just wanted to bring um, to highlight some of those items. Um, and to thank um, Jackie and the uh, Southeast Advisory as well as all the advisories for what they do. They're gonna be having some interesting meetings for 2023, 2024 including artificial intelligence, ESOL, staffing, special education, and behavior and safety. So that was it regarding um, information, and then I had a separate comment. So. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, this boundary study process has been very interesting. I think this was very difficult. Um, it was a challenge because it was a middle school and there were so many schools involved. I think it's one of the largest ones that we've had um, in years. So. Thank you to board members Hen and board member Dominowski for acknowledging the hard work of the committee to try to make um, the best decision. And um, it, it's not an easy decision in trying to hear all of the, um, the voices and figure out a map that's going to work for everyone. So I do appreciate the work of the committee I, I participated in, so I know it's difficult. Um, I think this was important, though, to highlight um, where we definitely have some deficiencies in the process. And so when you have, again, equal representation across a committee and they bring four uh, plans and then the last plan actually had to have a revote in order to get out to the public and, that pub and then it becomes the top map, I think that's kind of where we need to look at process and how things are viewed. And so while emails may be sent to say, here are surveys, here are results, again, you have to look at four out of 11 communities providing over 80% of a voice is not, it, we're not hearing everybody's voices. So we've got to figure out a way to make sure that all the voices are heard and then to make sure that that information is provided to the committee so that they feel comfortable and understand all of the decisions um, as far as what they're bringing to, um, to the board. So thank you again to the committee for their work and thank you to the board for that discussion. Um, and I think we have work to do and we all know that. And so looking forward to um, doing that work and making this boundary process better for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have comments? Okay. Um, next item or the last item on the agenda is announcements. Um, the board will be holding a special virtual meeting on Tuesday, July 25th, 2023, to discuss and vote on personnel matters at 6.30 p.m. So while it was very exciting to see the amount of internal candidates that received promotions um, 
two weeks ago and tonight, that is leads to a domino effect where we have vacancies that will spiral down um, into the classroom at times. Um, we are very, really trying to recruit, so part of that is to make sure that we get the people we need in our classrooms. So adding this meeting on the 25th will allow a lot of the vacancies that are occurring to be filled and other ones posted, or will allow principals to be able to put um, new candidates into those teacher vacancies. So it is very exciting to see the amount of internal candidates, but we also have to realize what that does as far as leaving vacancies. So the meeting on the 25th will be very similar to the meeting we held um, two weeks ago. It'll be virtual, and the only agenda item will be to vote um, and confirm personnel matters that are ready at that time. Um, and then our next regularly scheduled board, board meeting will be on Tuesday, August 8th, 2023 at 630. Thank you for joining us. You're going to tell Ms. Harvey how a time we left here tonight. Um, so at this time, the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>